Well, I'm so excited to welcome John and Stacy to the podcast. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, love everything you guys do, and so excited to spend some time with you both. Thank it's you. really a pleasure for us. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Oh, you you bet. You know, uh, Stacy and I did a Facebook Live not too long ago, and one of the things we talked about was longing for more and unmet desires in, desires in marriage, that that's not really a bad thing. So what what do you mean by that? Well, I think it keeps you alive, right? If you're if you're settled and everything is status quo, that's that's a nice pause. But I think just as being a human being, we're created to want to be growing and experiencing more. So I think there's always more available. Yeah. 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 I I Kim, I think it's not should you, you are longing for more. That that is the nature of your humanity. That is what it means to have a heart. You are longing for more in your marriage and in your life. The question is, what are you doing with those longings? Absolutely. So when your people are hearing this or wrestling with it, um, where do they? How do they start finding that fulfillment? Fulfillment in Jesus? Because you know, ever since what the money or the movie the color of money was that it with tom cruise when they said you complete me it's like no (laughs) your spouse can't totally complete you so how do we let jesus do what he wants to do and then also let our spouse do what god designed them to do dr kim i think that is the question really because um apart from god you you can't have the marriage that you long for and if we're not finding our, our identity, our meaning, our validation first in him, then we really don't have anything to bring to our spouse. Yeah. Oswald Jampers said that the only person that can satisfy the aching abyss of the human heart is Jesus, mm. Jesus Christ. And so friends, the kindest thing you can do for your marriage is to get all that longing off of it and turned into your relationship with Jesus. Because then you, you've taken so much pressure off your spouse and the marriage itself to come through. That's, I think that's such a good point. I remember when John said to me, um, I'm not the report card on your life. And I had really given that report card over to him. So how he was responding to me, if he was happy, if he liked the meal, if he thought I was responding well to the children, if and, and anything and everything, every day he had the report card on my life. And it put so much pressure on him mm-hmm. to, to validate me. And it also put me up for grabs all of the time of how am I doing before being able to stand on the love of God and that my value, my worth, my being beloved Mm. was not up for grabs. When, when that began to grow in my life, it allowed a freedom in our marriage that we hadn't had before. You liked that when that report card came out. It was immensely relieving. It really (laughs) was. Well, but Stacey, at that time where you, you thought you were doing what you should be doing, well, I did, but it really was stemming from an insecurity yeah, and, and just not knowing and, who yeah. I was and giving it to him. That was just, you know, he might be in a bad mood. He might be going through something yeah. hard. So that was just a dangerous thing to do. Yeah. But I think we can do that pretty often. And I think it's pretty yes. easy to do uh, in, in our relationships and in our expectations that we bring into marriage and expectations, the other person and yeah. all that stuff gets, comes in and just gets us, causes a lot of turmoil. Oh, I am so glad you used the word expectations because mm. we were just chatting the other day that today's expectations are tomorrow's resentments. Mm. That's so good. Yeah. Because I think, I had so many unrealistic expectations coming into marriage. Um, and my parents had a great marriage and Nancy came from a, um, alcoholic family and those kind of things. So man, my expectations, it just didn't fit what we were going to do or try to do or what God wanted us to do, I guess is really there. And so that, that caused us a lot of problems in the early part of our marriage. Yeah. The expectations. I know that I even had a lot on myself. 
Mm-hmm. I thought that as soon as we got married, I, I never cooked before we got married, but I just thought that as soon as I said I do, I would somehow become Martha Stewart or Betty Crocker. <laughs> I would I would know how to do it and meal plan and make amazing things and and oh my goodness. That was just a that was just a taste, a small little area of where I thought I was going to be utterly transformed into I don't know the what I that thought was the amazing wife. It didn't yeah. happen. Yeah. So you kind of had this checklist really then, Stacey, of, okay, if I'm going to be a really good wife, I've got to, I got to be able to cook. I got to do this, this, and this. Yeah. And I never, I didn't, um, I didn't think I did. It wasn't something conscious. I didn't have my list written out anywhere. Sure. So I think that's where it surprised me. I remember this one night when John came home and I was lying on the couch exhausted after work and he, and he asked me what's for dinner because it was only a few weeks into our marriage. And I said, I don't know. And he said, thank the living God. (laughs) (laughs) Cause of the pressure I was putting it on him. I was putting it on all of us. Yeah. Yeah. So was that what, what was your expectation at that time, John? Did you, when, and then Stacy's just jumping through hoops all the time. What, what were you thinking when that was going on? I like it that she said they're, they're unconscious expectations. Yeah. We loved each other. We loved Christ. We came in yeah. with a beautiful relationship, but you don't realize everything else you're bringing to the table so much of it out of your childhood, broken places, unhealed trauma. Um, I thought that everything was just going to be fine, that I was a completely great guy that didn't need any working on, that I, I, my transformation was done. It was complete. Yeah. And by the way, we're young and we're brand new Christians. Not brand new, but young in Christ. And I just thought, hey, we have God, we have each other, everything's fine, Right. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think, gang, um, if you don't know what your expectations are that you're bringing, look at your anger mm. and, and look at your sadness, because that will help you identify what am I so mad about mm-hmm. but, what, or what am I so mm. sad about? And, and then it would also be really healthy if, if your relationship can sustain it to ask your spouse, honey, What's the pressure I'm putting on you? What are the expectations that you feel from me? Because oftentimes, you know, Stacy was describing, I didn't put that set of expectations that she'd be an amazing cook on her. Yeah. Uh, and so if you could name it and then the two of you can disarm it and go, babe, that no way. Let's, that is not what I'm expecting. That could be very lovely to disarm some of that just verbally. And I think sometimes we just don't talk about it, do we? We just keep going through that and exhausting ourselves and putting pressure on each other instead of just, you know, the communication part of that is so important. And, yeah, you know, we were young too. We were 20 years old. We got married and we thought we knew everything. And, and I can remember before uh, I worked with my dad for a while before I went to back to school to become a counselor. And I remember thinking that, Okay, if you're a Christian, you're married. Well, I don't want to be a Christian marriage counselor because they don't they don't need that because they're <laughs> right. Christians and they're married and they won't have problems. And then six months into marriage, I thought, oh yeah, <laughs> it doesn't it isn't as easy as sometimes we think it would be. Yeah, yeah. So I want to go back to your first question, yes. if you don't mind, because um, I I think having those kinds of conversations can be very scary, mm. and, and and to ask your spouse that is very vulnerable. And so I think that comes back around to why do you have to find your security in Christ? Why do you have to have your life there? Because you can only be there that you'll be able to take the risk to know that you're, you're okay. Like you can walk together in some difficult conversations. You can mm. look at your life. You can look at your style of relating because you're, you're actually okay. You're going to be okay. And I, I know I needed that. And it took quite a while for me to be able to stay in the room and have a hard conversation with John in order to hear ways that I was failing. Yeah. Until I was, until I really knew that I belonged to God. It was my father's daughter and I was going to be okay. The ground was not going to open up and swallow me whole mm. if yeah. something didn't go well. Mm. That's so good. That's so good. 
So somebody's watching, listening today, and they think, God, that sounds so good. What's the first step in finding fulfillment in Jesus? What would you say to them? That's such a big question. I'm looking at John, so he can okay. go first. <laughs> it's really important to know that we're not just talking about believing in Jesus. Many people believe in God or believe in Jesus Christ, but they are not in experiencing life with him, mm. satisfaction in him. They're not experiencing God as a profound source of love mm. in their life. And so, gang, like we're not just talking about go to church or, or, or show up, you know, on Wednesdays. What, what we're saying is the psalm says, for you alone, O Lord, are the fountain of life, that, that you, you discover the most wonderful thing in the world as you begin to take both your heart's longings and your heart aches, your wounds, the trauma from your life, and to bring that into intimacy with Jesus. He's able to heal. He's able to love. He is able to minister to your soul. You, you take all of that deep, deep heart stuff to Jesus first. Mm. And we're not saying that you don't ever take that to your spouse. We're not saying that at all. But we're saying that out of an intimate union with Jesus, the soul is actually made for union with God. Mm. I'm the vine. He said, you're a branch. We're supposed to be one, mm. united. Well, then, as you're united with Christ, what Stace was describing, the security to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. the confidence to be brave, right? The, the, the hurts from your childhood. You know, how many times in our marriage have one of us projected onto the other the hurts? You know, at one point I had to tell Stace, I'm not your father. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not your dad. So all that heartache, all that longing, Jesus wants to care for that with mm -hmm. you, friends. Mm -hmm. And as we cultivate that with Christ, yeah. holy cow. First off, it's wonderful, everybody. Like, <laughs> he's the healer. He yeah. is the source of life. But then it, it just opens up whole new levels of love in your marriage because you're doing better. It does. I know for me, um, the process really started by me asking Jesus, who am I to you? Can mm. you show me who I am to you? And then um, spending a ton of time in Ephesians chapter one, which is still one of my favorites because it just speaks so much to that. Mm. Or, um, and yeah. Neil Anderson has this list of who am I in Christ? Yeah. And I printed that thing off and I read it every day for two years just saturating my heart in the truth and, and asking God to speak to me and believing, taking the risk to believe he actually wanted to. That was, that was the beginning of the journey to, to know these things that John is talking about, this more that's available, this union, yeah. this intimacy with Christ. Yeah, I think it just, you know, I love that you said that about the list of truths that Neil Anderson, and because I think we just need to continue to put that into us. I mean, for some people, it may be just, they, they say, Jesus come in and everything happens. But for most of us, I think it is kind of a transformation and, and yes. trusting and learning because it's kind of foreign to us. One yeah. that someone would love me unconditionally. I mean, that's, that was, that's a tough concept to get a hold of. And <laughs> it I, I, this seems to me sometimes God just stands, just is waiting for us to take that first step so he can show off, so he can show up, so he can begin to show us how much he cares and loves. And I know for some people it's risky because they, they don't know, or they, am I going to give up control? Does this mean I can't ever dance again? Or, you know, listen right. to my favorite rock band? You know, we get all these things that go around in our head and just, no, there's just so much freedom that comes in it. So yes. much freedom. And he's so much better than we thought. The more we know him, the more we love him. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's just taking that, taking that step and letting Jesus begin to do what he wants to do in our lives. Yes. So good. 
Yes. So, so let's talk about you guys had a kind of a rocky period, three years into marriage, you each went to counseling. So how much of your, and John, you kind of lose a little bit, how much of your past stories impacted your marriage? Oh my goodness, gang. So this year, we've been married 40 years, this right. coming October, and we are still healing. Yeah from our childhood yeah. and that healing is still bringing profound breakthrough in our marriage. So I want to describe this hopeful journey of um, Jesus is committed to your wholeheartedness. Mm -hmm. He is committed to your healing gang. And so, yeah, it, it often takes place through um, the rocky times, the arguments, may, maybe even the breakups that happen so that he can get to the underlying things. Uh, so was it three years into marriage, Stace, that you said over the kitchen table one morning, I think we ought to get a divorce? Yes, <clears throat> very casually, like past the jam. And it was really because we had we were living such separate lives and marriage was not what I had thought it was going to be. We didn't we didn't have a shared vision. It was very much just not dual connected. paths, just well, not connected. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and, and, and a lot of it was built around my selfishness. Mm -hmm. And, and it, if you don't, yeah, like I thought I was a fairly generous, kind hearted, open person until I married. And then I realized, wow, I am really self centered. And so I was doing my thing, which forced Stacy to do her thing. And, and it brought up, um, yeah, there, was, there wasn't the intimacy there. And, mm -hmm. and so we both went to counseling. And for me, I grew up in an alcoholic home. And I grew up with a very, very unattached mother. Um, she, she had to go back to work because of the alcoholism and all that. Mm -hmm. and, and she was gone. I, I mean, I, I have no memories of playing with my mom. I have no memories of her reading a book to me. And my dad was an alcoholic. And so, again... We, we had a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, but simply coming to Christ doesn't immediately heal your childhood trauma. Yeah. And it was all of that that had to come to the surface. And, and you were talking earlier, Kim, about what builds intimacy with Christ. The single thing more than anything else in my life that has built intimacy with Jesus is, is his healing of my broken heart, mm. the love of Jesus, the actual presence of Jesus in us, Christ now lives in us, healing, you know, the, the heartache from my childhood, that was enormous for me to be a, a better man and a more loving man to Stace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think to me, it seems like it, it's usually a process. And I think that's, it's certainly God could just, Take, I've taken all that away and said, okay, I'm going to zap that. You're healed, blah, blah, blah. But it seems like it's that process. We learn so much in that process and we, we learn to trust him. And I think if he just healed me of things quickly, I might just kind of, I don't take it for granted or not really learn what I need to learn in it. And even though it's painful sometimes, mm -hmm. I think it, that's, that's more beneficial. Does, do you agree? I, I I want the zap be healed model. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> One zap. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but I I do think that our character develops. Yeah. The quality of our souls, the beautification of our hearts. It it happens in hardship. I know that for me, that I am still not a woman who is as desperate for God when things are good as I am desperate for God when things are hard. Yeah. And it's in it's in those times that I have really come to know who he is and and his love in the midst of pain, in the midst of unhealed wounds and questions that are unanswered. That that is what has really forged my relationship to know the faithfulness of God. Mm, that's that's so powerful. So powerful. Um what would we have missed? Or when, if we gave up when it was hard, or if you guys gave up when it was hard, if that day when Stacy said, I think we need to get divorced past the jam, if you would have said, okay, what would you have Three missed? children, three daughters-in-law, five grandchildren. 
yeah. and a ton of joy and intimacy and knowing and a shared life. I mean, we just, you know, talking about how the hard things with God and our lives strengthen our relationship with God, the hard things in our marriage strengthen our relationship in our marriage. John is in it for me and with me. And I know that. Yeah. And I might not have known that before. If I mean, of course, I wouldn't have known that if we had just bailed, but he's he's not a man who bails. And I know that I'm the priority in his heart. And that is wow to know that. Absolutely. So yeah, I got to answer, John. What, what did you say when she said that? When she said, I think we need to get a divorce past the jam. Um, panic. Yeah. Uh, uh oh. <laughs> um, and I immediately actually booked us a weekend away so that we could go away and talk about these things together. Oh, wow. Um, that's awesome. But Kim, like, what would we have missed? Because mm. we we've hit more than one hard place sure. in our marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, God wants to use your story in other people's lives mm. and the journey that we've taken together and the journey that we've taken with Christ, the journey that our family has taken has brought healing and intimacy with Jesus literally to hundreds of thousands of people Yeah, because of, of our work in the world now and our ministry, our writing, our books and stuff like that. Yeah. But all that, all that <clears throat> grew out of, our healing and our choice to stay together. Mm. So good. Ours came at, six, at the sixth year uh, when mm. Nancy said, I don't know whether we should stay married or not. I don't know if I love you enough to stay married. I don't, mm. you know, and a lot of it was because mm. myself. I mean, we look back now, we, the pieces fit together pretty good how we got there. God brought a, a, a lady into her life that she went and talked to that I am eternally grateful to because she said she, Nancy wouldn't talk to her like it was a friend of Nancy's, not that it was Nancy having this problem. And yeah. this lady said, you know, you tell your friend to stay in that marriage and work and God, God's going to make something beautiful out of it. And it, that's what Nancy needed to hear. And it was just like she came home. She said, we're going to make this work. And mm. I said, let's take divorce off the table for the rest of our marriage. And wow. we did. Mm. At times, mm. I kind of wanted to throw it back on, but you know, it was like. But we had the hard. Yeah, it hadn't been all roses since then, like you were saying, John. It, it you still go through things, but when you know that you're committed to each mm. other and you've taken the loophole mm. out, the exit door away. Mm -hmm. I just look at couples that I counsel or know of that maybe been married three, four, mm. five years and they get divorced, and I think the heart of this question, what they're going to miss, what they're mm. going to miss by not growing and learning and, and not having those children together or have children in a broken home and, you know, and to what, what they could have 20, 25 years. We, were, we just separate our 50, celebrate our 53rd, third, 53rd wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Just, you know, and it's just like, it goes, God is, you know, we've talked a lot, I guess this last year about what God has taught us mm. over the years. And, and, like you were saying, John, the opportunity to, to share that with other people, to let them know that my little granddaughter that's 13, uh, she said all of her friends were talking and they, they had all, they, for some reason, all her friends follow me on us on TikTok, which is crazy, <laughs> but they, they knew we were married 53 years. And one little girl, she said, one of my friends said, I can't stand a boy more than three weeks. How can I be with somebody for 53 years? And I, and I think it goes back, you, you do it because you see <clears throat> that that's God's plan and, and he's there to help you through it. And, mm -hmm. and, well, and, and gang, let's be honest. Let's be honest. If you bail on the marriage, do you really think that the living God is going to then deliver you up the ideal marriage? This stuff is going to come right back around everybody. You can't run from your personal transformation. Mm -hmm. And this is why most people bail. Uh, now, now let, you know, because we're therapists, let's just be honest and say, look, some marriages are violent. Yeah. Some marriages oh, are yeah. highly abusive. And in those circumstances, you must get to a place of safety. Absolutely. So that's not what we're saying. We're not saying go back and take the abuse, go back and take the the violence. Right. That is not what we're saying today. 
But what we're saying is this, is that honestly, if you bail on this relationship, you're going to face the exact same man or woman the next day in the mirror. Like all of your problems are going to stay right there with you, no matter how far you run. Hmm. And I think it's a lesson, you know, and I, and I know, and I've seen some people with second marriages that have finally realized that. And, and I've had a lot of them say, you know, I love my marriage I'm in now. I wish that I've known this. I wish I would have done that in my first marriage. And so mm-hmm. God is a God of second chances. And I think yes. he does. Yes, absolutely. A lot through a second marriage. Um, so whoever, if you're listening and you're in your first or second marriage or third, or I, I had one couple, <laughs> this guy, they, she had been married twice and he'd been married. This was his sixth marriage, but he finally oh. got it. And they have an incredible marriage. Wow. You know? And and it just showed me how God is so good and so patient with us, just that he would just continue yeah. with this guy that was kind of a train wreck. And all of a sudden, God got him on the right track. Mm, it's so cool. Yeah. It's so cool. Mm-hmm. So how do our stories, parts of our story of reflect God's story, even if they are hard, and even if they are painful at times? Because they're hard. Mm. Because they're painful. God's story is a story of redemption that comes at enormous cost. Jesus Christ is in one place described in the scriptures as the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So getting into the story of God does not mean that everything becomes Disneyland. Mm. Getting into the story of God is what opens up the story of redemption. And, And it is in the heartache it's in the heart that the redemption takes place and and then people get to see it they need Mm. to see an incarnate experience they need to see wait what you grew up in a in an alcoholic home and yet you're doing well tell me about that how did you overcome that you were you had childhood trauma like it's our stories yeah that usher in the redemptive story of god Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so good, mm-hmm. Stacy. Do you think you think, you think you think about the power of testimony? Mm-hmm. That the here here it is. It's in hearing other people's stories and the invasion of God, the way He has interfered, the way He's pursued and rescued. Mm-hmm. That brings hope. That brings life. So yeah, that is the intersection of my story with the story of God. Is are the high? It's the highlight reel. It's where the life comes in. Yeah. And we do need to hear other people's stories. You know, we overcome by our testimony. I think so. I think you had on something too, John, that I want to go back. The, the fact that I think sometimes we are don't understand what it means when we come to Christ and that we do expect everything to be good. And then I went through this with a young man this, this last year and counseling with him. And it basically, he went through some really tough times in the past two years. And he felt God wasn't there. God abandoned him, <clears throat> uh, you know, because God, he, this was pretty much a Disneyland God and, and Disneyland God wasn't there. And so it, it just, he had to come to the point of realizing that you are going to go through hard times yeah. and you've got somebody that's going to walk through with it that has all the answers. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, mm-hmm. I will fear no evil for you are with me. It's not that you get to walk around the valley of the shadow of death. You walk through it with God. That's Mm -hmm. so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's there with us. Yeah, always. That was so good. Um, You guys have written, you've written a lot about resilience. Uh, How can a marriage become more resilient? What does that look like even? Oh gosh, that's such a good question. Yeah. I'm, I have no idea how Stacy's going to answer this, so I'm really curious to hear what she says. <laughs> well, I think it all it goes back. You know, we're just kind of talking about the same things here because um, a Christ-centered marriage, and then and then the power of testimony because you look back and you see the faithfulness of God. Mm. Yes. He came through here. This is really a, when you hit a hard place. Okay, I'm just going to say when we're in a hard place. I forget the good times and I'll think that it's always been hard. And that, and that's really where I need the intervention of Jesus to remind me. No, no, that's not true. And we can walk through this 
and we'll, and it will get good again because then when it's good, I can't remember that it's ever been hard, Yeah, but that could be just me. No, but I think really, you're right. I think it is. Yeah, it is. Mm. And it's hard. And we think, wow, what am I doing? Yeah. yeah. But his faithfulness and mm. looking back helps me to look forward, mm. knowing John, having so a testimony of years together and, um, playing together, developing other aspects of our relationship. It's not just, we're not roommates, just paying the bills and keeping the house. We're partners in a shared mission in life. And we have fun together. We laugh together. And so pouring all of the many aspects of our relationship together is, is really what helps give it the strength that it has so that we can move forward. That's so good. I, I, you said the word shared mission. I think that is so important for a couple to, to develop. And obviously your mission is, is very visible because of the things that you guys have done. So how does a couple find that shared mission? Because I think that unites you in a really powerful way and puts God right where he wants to be. Mm -hmm. So there, I think there are two great conversions in the Christian life. And the first one comes when we turn back to God and we come to salvation through Jesus Christ. But the second great conversion is when you discover that God wants intimacy with you and that he wants to talk to you, mm. learning to hear the voice of God. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. In Hebrews chapters three and four, today if you hear his voice, in Revelation 3, a knock on the door, if anyone hears my voice. The reason I'm bringing this up is that learning to do listening prayer together as a couple has been so wonderful for us. Not just, um, you know, when you're in a hard place and like, gosh, how do we get out of debt, Lord? Or what do we do about, you know, this job? No, no, no. For joy, for guidance. Stacy mentioned play as a resilient, you know, as part of the resilience of a marriage. God has guided us into so much joy because we paused and listened mm -hmm. and asked, what do you have for us this year, Father? What do you want us to do for Christmas? Where do you want us to go for summer? Like he has so much to say. And so when it comes to shared mission, I, I would say this would be such a beautiful thing to pray about together and listen to God and let him speak into your marriage. Lord, you brought us together. What's our mission? So good. Yeah, because he's not going to give one of you, Stacy, one answer and you another answer. He's going to give, he's not, he's going to put you guys together. On yeah. That. You're yeah. There's a reason why you got married. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> there's, there's a reason why the husband is the perfect husband for the wife and the wife is the perfect wife for the husband. You, you're bringing in desires and gifting and callings and yep. <clears throat> longings that actually are, are meant to join up. So yeah, being aware of those, bringing those to God and, and yes, asking them together, developing that conversational intimacy mm -hmm. yeah. as a couple, really vital. Yeah. That is so good. That is so good. So um, say they come have this goal. How do you work? I'll say it is the shared mission. How do you work toward that goal individually and together? How does that play out? You guys have done that. Well, when we're teaching listening prayer to couples, we always say, ask the next question. Because people will ask God, Lord, is it time for us to move? And they get a sense from God. They hear, yes, this is. And they don't, they don't ask when or where or, you know, he says, yes, I do want you to move two years from now. Mm. Yes, I do want you to change jobs six months from now. Ask the next question. That's so but, good. but of course, you're going to talk about shared dreams, shared desires. What's on your heart? Right. Do some dreaming together. That this is a this is an important part of our marriage. We'll often ask each other, honey, what's on your heart? What is what is Jesus stirring in you? Where are your passions right now? What do you want to do this year? Like to to dream together and then and then ask the next question. Don't just rush out on those dreams. <laughs> okay. Then you take those dreams to God and you yes. say, Father, what are you saying? Jesus, guide us. Are these dreams? For now, or are they for later? Mm. Are they for both of us? 
or is it just something you want me to do, right? Like the intimacy, you cannot get away from intimacy with God. The world doesn't work without it. Life mm -hmm. and marriage mm -hmm. sure doesn't work without it. No. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so good. Mm. Stacey, you thinking something? I was just, I was remembering how uh, in that crisis that we hit at three years in and, and how John, he actually booked this weekend away to where we had had our honeymoon. So it was really nice. special. And I can remember him, the walk that we took through the snow, where it clicked into me that, oh my goodness, the gifting, my story, the things that I've enjoyed or pursued, they fit perfectly with what John's story is. And um, it was just, it was, it was mind blowing to go, oh, I really am the right woman mm. for him. And with that in mind, to share what my personal dreams are, what made me come alive more and with his, and then to see that, oh, they, they actually intersect. And so then to begin to dream together with God about what that might look like, that that happened that early in our marriage. And and we started moving towards those. Now, it, it didn't it wasn't like we're going to go from A to B. We started moving in the direction we thought God had for us. And he did a detour and we'd follow mm -hmm. him. It looked different than we expected, but we were in it together. And that makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. And it, it's to me, it's there's. Um... I guess it's a joy that comes with that as you see God just kind of, I don't know, just kind of unveiling things or leading you. And, and you're right. Sometimes it's not exactly where I thought this was going to go, but it's always better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's so good. Yeah. Uh, so what is one way that you're seeing or sensing that God is um, at work as you're ministering to people today at this stage of life? Ooh, what a good question. I'm looking at you again, John. <laughs> we have we have entered the mentoring mm, yes. stage. Mm -hmm. Right? After 40 years of marriage, after 45 years of walking with Jesus intimately, we have a we have a lot to share. We have a lot of wisdom. We have a lot of pain that we've worked through. We have so much that he's taught us. And, and so we, you know, there's the stage where you become the elders in your church, the elders in your community, the elders at the gate, you know, in the old city of Jerusalem. We are, we are entering that stage and really enjoying being able to play that role in other people's lives. That's so good. That's it. That's really it. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I, th I think it, it, I think it, when God kind of started doing that with us and some people would ask us to mentor him and I thought, what do we have to offer? And God yeah. said, do you remember yeah. what I've taught you? Do you remember <laughs> what I have brought you guys through? You have a story yes. to share mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we do. And he, and he uses that. And it's so, so powerful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's really good. So one thing I wanted to mention, just because it, it's one of the coolest things that I've found in the last year, and that is the app, The Pause. And mm. your voice is so soothing, John. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but I, that's but lovely. I think the, that is just a great way. I think we all know that we need that. And it's such an easy way to do it is to click that on. And you can pick like what, one minute, five minutes, three minutes. You can have different lengths of time, mm -hmm. scripture in it, and then... And then I love it. Then you go, that's enough for today. And, and so it's, it's or for now. And so I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's such a powerful way to do something that we all know we need to do, but we mm -hmm. don't take time to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, what Kim's describing everybody is <clears throat> right before the pandemic. And when we, you know, we didn't know the pandemic was coming. We released an app. It's free. You can get it on iPhone and Android. It's called pause the one minute pause. And it is this lovely experience where twice a day, the app will take you through letting everything go, mm -hmm. coming back. It's beautiful music, beautiful scripture, centering yourself back in your life in God. And yeah, you can do it for 60 seconds. You can do it for three minutes. There's a five minute version. And then we also built in there 30 days to resilience, mm -hmm. which is this lovely morning and evening program. That, that will truly restore your soul's resilience. And what's fun, Kim, is that Stacey and I do it together. 
Like a, oh, you yeah. can do this we in listen marriage. Together. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Yeah. So our part of our bedtime prayers is we play one of the 30 days to resilient evening sessions. They're about eight minutes long, lovely music, scripture, and different yeah. voices from around the world as well. And and it to share that as a marriage mm -hmm. and to share that centering experience in Christ yeah. together, mm -hmm. it's awesome. Mm -hmm, that is, it is so good. Yes, I so, was just thinking right before you said that. I thought, oh my gosh, well, why am I not doing this with Nancy? And, and yeah, then you, you brought <clears> that up because it works. It, yeah, because we always have a, a quiet time together when we go to bed. And right now we've been doing some stuff from the Bible Project, which I love those guys. And love this that. would be a great way yes. uh, for us to begin to end that. But I just wanted people to know that that is there. And it's, uh, you know, what what great timing that God used on that right before the pandemic. I yeah. know. To have something out there like that. Something yeah, almost like almost half a million people have downloaded this app now. Unbelievable. And, and we're just getting in stories, stories, stories coming into our offices of how helpful it is. So it's called the One Minute Pause. It's free. And if you just start typing in the one minute, it's going to be one of the first things that comes yeah. up in the App Store. So, yeah, I hope you enjoy that, friends. Yeah, so good. So good. So as we kind of wrap up, uh, final question, what's something that you're really enjoying about your marriage today in this stage of life? You know, he mentioned, John mentions, um, I love doing this with him. This is one of the things I'm loving. I'm loving, I love listening to him. I just, um, but I love our, our bedtime ritual, which is really developed and it's extended now. It's, and now it's, it's kind of long, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but we love it. We dim the lights. There's little flickering candles. We listen to a couple of worship songs, center our hearts, and then We'll do a 30 days to resilient and then go into prayer. And it's just, it's just lovely. Oh, that's... It just, it just talk about union with your spouse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And gang, let me, let me hold out a hope for you. One of the most wonderful things about our marriage now is that we both have a safe place to process things. Mm -hmm. it, uh, what I love about our marriage right now is that we can process what's going on with our kids. We can mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. what's going on at work. We can process what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. That I, I have someone I can talk to, to who it's so helpful to hear Stacy to think through things, pray through things together. Just having that, yeah. holy cow, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. And, and it takes, and you, and you just build that over your marriage, don't you? You just, the, as you trust each other more, as you let your walls down, as you yeah. work through things like an alcoholic family of origin and things like that, to get to the point where, yeah, that's just good. Plus, you're at the paint porch where we are. We don't have to help people with homework at night. We don't have to make sure they're in bed at certain times. So we can yeah, do things true. like that. You know, <laughs> that's true. You have a freedom that's now. <clears throat> but, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. That is, That's you know, yes. that is really good. Yes. Uh, this has been awesome, guys. You guys, I love you both. I love what you do. Thanks, uh, Kim. Mention the Pause app. Other places that people can find you now or that you would like to let people know what's going on? Well, our website is our, our wildatheart.org. Just has tons of resources, writings, videos, uh, blogs, daily readings, all kinds of stuff that we just want to offer and help pour into people that encourage their life with God. So that's yep. the place to go. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, first, when I first read Wild at Heart, I thought, who is this guy? And <laughs> <laughs> I'll just see all this. Yeah, it's, mm. it's awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much again for being a part of this. Um, loved connecting with you. Look yeah. forward to seeing you guys again. Yeah. Bless Thanks. you, pal. Thank, thank you. you.